Hi, my name is Hod Greeley. I'm a staff engineer here at the San Jose Mobile Communication Lab with Samsung Communications. Today we're going to talk about OpenGL. Uh, we're going to give a little bit of an introduction to it. And this is going to be uh, what you would use typically for doing 3D graphics on Android. OpenGL, to give an overview, is a standard for rendering 2D and 3D graphics. It's becoming increasingly important due to 3D graphics capabilities that are prevalent on mobile devices more and more now. It was originally developed by Silicon Graphics back in 1992. Of course, Silicon Graphics was extremely well known for their graphics hardware. Uh, man it currently is managed by a nonprofit con technology consortium called the Kronos Group. Uh, now, OpenGL on the phone, we actually have typically OpenGL ES, which is for embedded systems, and it's a subset of the larger OpenGL standard. The features of OpenGL it renders 3D geometry defined by triangles to a frame buffer, can handle 2D graphics as well because that's just a degenerate case of 3D graphics, uh, it takes advantage of the dedicated hardware that's very efficient at processing the geometry and images. So when you hear of a, talking about a GPU, that's the dedicated graphics processing unit. And it can perform arbitrary processing on geometry and images. So the key concepts that we're going to cover in this video are vertexes and vertex arrays, polygons, viewing position, visible volume, and this thing called a frustum, which is kind of a weird word, but that's the term that people use. Okay, so to start with, we wanted to show our base scene that we're going to be using for our discussion here. So let's imagine that we're going to build a space game or something. So here we have a spaceship and we have, you know, maybe a, a, a little robot, our favorite little robot, and uh, an army guy running around with whatever it is he's holding. So how are we going to start taking this scene and actually going from that to rendering it? So the first thing we'll talk about are vertex and vertex arrays and polygons, how you describe a, a polygon with this. So vertices are a series of points defined by three coordinates. This is 3D graphics, so hopefully you have something that's three-dimensional. Uh, primitive shapes can be formed by joining together vertices. Uh, polygons can be constructed in, in two ways. So you could define just a bunch of vertices and have the actual polygon, so like a dodecahedron, but then that actually gets complicated as the number of sides increase. And what's cool, though, is that you can actually construct any polygon you want out of much more simple shapes. And in particular, what's used most often are triangles. So when you hear about tessellating something with and the number of triangles involved, that's what's uh, meant by that. Using a vertex array, this is going to reduce the number of function calls, and it also allows you to reduce some of the redundancy because you can reuse shared vertices as you go along. So a vertex array and polygons. So here we have an example of where we're going to want to show how you can actually define shapes more and more uh, better resolution by increasing the number of polygons involved. So off to the left we start with something that's very simple. So let's say we're trying to approximate a sphere here. You can say we've shown we've used a very small number of triangles and you know from a distance it looks like a sphere but it really wouldn't go over that well necessarily if you're doing close-ups or anything. So on the next in the middle figure we show where we've added several more triangles and you can see it's kind of growing out to look much more like a sphere but we're still not there yet. And then what we've shown on the rightmost figure is having gone crazy with specifying a huge number of triangles 
And you can see we've been able to define not, not only a really nice looking sphere, but also something with much more detail. So we've got little details like sort of these caps on top of this, the main sphere, and then of course the, the edge planes uh, of the spacecraft and all these things like this. And this is all done by tessellating things into uh, using simple triangles. Okay, so we've defined our scene. We've actually figured out how to represent our objects, uh, reducing them into a set of triangles. So now we're going to go ahead and the next most important thing is to define your, your viewing position. So it's the viewing position uh, of the observer looking into the scene. So here we're going to have a few key things. We have the eye point. So this is, you know, the the eye point of the observer looking into the scene. You have the look at point. So right now I'm facing into the camera and my look at point is sort of on top of the camera here. Uh, so that's the direction that I'm looking from my eye position. And then we have the up vector. So the up vector, remember like if you're doing a space game, up isn't necessarily, there's no gravity, so up isn't really well defined. And so you want to have an up that's defined relative to your scene. So I can have, you know, if I have my ship here, I might choose up to be this way, or I might decide that I actually want the uh, up for the viewer to be off this way so things look tilted and so on. So here's a diagram going back to our original scene and now we're adding in the, the, the viewer. And so we've got the eye point illustrated and we have the look at point. So right now we set it up so the eye point is with the figure and then the viewing, the look at position is kind of centered on the, the spacecraft. All right, so now that we've set up our scene and where we're looking at it from, we want to choose what volume of that scene we're actually going to expose to the viewer. And this is going to be de defined, again, using this thing called a frustum. Now, a frustum is not a word that people typically come across, but it actually has a pretty simple definition. It's just a truncated pyramid. So visible volume and frustums, how are we going to define things? So there's lots of ways you could define a truncated pyramid. The way you do it in OpenGL typically is by using a set of, essentially you're defining um, three things. So here I'm going to talk about thing, I'm going to, I'm going to use a particular analogy for how to think about this. And this will make sense as you look at the illustrations. So what I want to imagine is that you're looking at your scene through a window. Now, if you're far away from the window, which is what we've illustrated in the upper diagram, the window is going to restrict the view that you can see. And of course, if you're far away from this window, you're only going to be able to see a small part of the screen of the scene because your scene is going to be cut off by by the window edges. Now if I walk up closer to the window, I can actually see a lot more of the scene. So that's illustrated by the lower diagram. And we've shown it from two different angles, so you can see it kind of from the viewpoint, and then you can, uh, the side illustration where we're showing the viewer and the objects, and then kind of from the viewer's perspective where we're looking dead on into the window and you can see from the red outlines what it is that you're going to actually be able to view of the scene. Okay, so that's two of the three pieces of the frustum. So the um, last piece that we need to define is uh, the back plane here. So here again we're illustrating this time we're going down the left side to compare versus down the right side to compare. And we're showing that we're going to define the back plane in terms of the distance from that front window. So we're still using this kind of analogy that you're looking through a window, but we have this kind of oddity that you don't run into in real life where you've actually got a back plane that's going to truncate part of the scene. And this is sort of for two reasons. Well, the main reason really is that uh, you want to cut out parts of your scene and this is going to help 
OpenGL because it can tell what's included in that scene and what's not and can go ahead and discard all of the stuff that it doesn't have to bother to render. So going back to our example here, we're showing the case where we're up close to the front window and on the left side we've actually defined the back plane to be quite a ways back. And so you can see kind of the top illustration we're showing the distance to the back plane. The middle illustration we've shown where the back plane lies when you're looking at the scene from the side. And then in the bottom illustration we're showing what, what happens with the scene uh, where the backplane is, and you can see what that has eliminated from your scene. So then going down the right side, we see in this case we've actually defined the backplane to be much closer. So again, the top level illustration is showing the distance to the backplane. The middle one is the side view that's showing you how that plane is intersecting with things. And then the bottom one is showing you the front-on view, and you can see that we've cut off most of the spacecraft we've really left with just uh, part of the fins still there, but we still have uh, other elements like the robot that are visible. So those are the th elements that you need to define your frustum. And here we have illustrated what your frustum looks like in the end. And just to review the, the pieces that we have, so we have the observer's distance to the front window, we have the dimensions of the front window, and then we have the distance to that back plane. And if you look at this diagram, you'll see that that is actually going to be everything we need to define our truncated pyramid or our frustum. All right, so now that we've talked about the frustum, we're going to look over some of the key APIs for how you're going to inform OpenGL, basically the calls you're going to make and the data that you're going to use to pass to OpenGL to go ahead and render this scene. So the first thing is you remember we talked about how to define our shapes and that corresponds to uh, telling OpenGL about the vertex arrays and you're going to do that with this GL vertex pointer call and you're going to hand it uh, the dimension of the vertices. So again, we could do two or three dimensions. So typically uh, for 3D graphics, you're of course going to be using 3D dimensions. Uh, you're going to tell it what kind of values are included and you're going to actually give it the buffer. After that, you're going to go ahead and uh, use a couple things here. The main thing being this GL draw elements piece. Uh, what we've got included here beforehand is actually going ahead and setting a, a color. So we're just going to go ahead and draw using one color and then we're going to draw a series of elements. And we're going to do that with the GL draw elements. And what we're doing is uh, we're going to give it the shape to draw. And there's a number, I can't go into too much detail here. In this case, we're showing the GL line loop um, call. We're giving it five indices. So you can see here where we can uh, kind of reuse indices when you look into the uh, how this API works a little bit more. Again, we're going to give it a value that's the size of each index, and then we actually pass in the index buffer. So we had the vertex buffer for the uh, vertex data, and then we have to draw the elements. We are going to be using that vertex buffer, and so we need to hand in an index array to decide which vertices we're going to use out of that buffer. So now we get into the parts that define uh, some of the other things. So we talked about how we need to define the viewer's position and where they're looking. And you're going to do that using this G GLU look at call. So the other one started with GL, which is uh, OpenGL. And GLU is, is kind of an additional um, library that gives you some extra capabilities. So we're going to use this GLU look at call we're going to give it then the eye position, the view direction, and the orientation. So all those elements that we talked about earlier. And then finally, we've got this one function call that's going to go ahead and define that, that 3D volume, your, your, your frustum, your truncated pyramid. So here, 
If you remember, the elements that we had for that were the front window. So your first arguments here are actually scaled relative to each other. So you have the dimensions of the front window, but they're typically defined in terms of one edge being just unit length, and then the other edge um, being defined in terms of a ratio. So if you have your horizontal edge that might be designated as one unit scaled, and then your vertical edge might be uh, given as a ratio to that. And then you have the distance from the viewer to the front plane, and then you have the distance from the viewer to the rear plane. This takes maybe a little bit getting used to, but it's easy to play around and kind of see how those parameters affect things and your volume. So that's a good thing to play with a bit to get a good feel for what's going on. Now, what I've been talking about are APIs that come in OpenGLS uh, 1.x. <laughs> now, there's OpenGL ES 2.0, which was public released back in March 2007. So this is actually a relatively new API uh, update. What's important to know is that OpenGLS 2.0 is not backward compatible with 1.1. So this is something you want to be a little bit careful with when you have a case that some devices are going to support 2.0 and some are going to support earlier versions 1. Point something. So they have the same basic capabilities, but OpenGL AS 2.0 has actually generalized things a bit. So with 1.1, you have fixed functions, so part of your graphics pipeline is just the transformations you can't do anything about. And 2.0 replaces these with programmable stages. So what's important with 2.0 is that you're adding some uh, same basic capabilities for doing shading and stuff, but with a lot more flexibility. And here we have a sample application. You can download this sample from the, our developer site. This is for our developer support. It's developer.samsung.com, nice easy name. And we're showing something that's very simple. We have two shapes, and we've got them overlapping. And what we can't show here is that they're actually uh, animated. They're going to be rotating at different rotation rates, so you can see how that rotation affects things, and you can play with things like your, your volumes that you're looking at. And we've just shown some easy uh, color shading for the different sides. So that just gives you some simple ideas about some of that. So that's the basic introduction to OpenGL. We really focused on things like defining your shapes, defining your volume, and your eye position, all those things to get a basic scene going. There's a lot more you can do with it. In particular, you can do things like surface texturing, which will be really important for, for making things look really realistic if you want you know, an outdoor scene or something like that. And so uh, we'll leave that for a later tutorial. So thanks for watching, and that's it.